or remain standing. We're going to sing that chorus this morning. Mighty is our God. Mighty is our King. Let's worship God. Come on back in. Let's get ready for our last seminar. Mighty is our God. Mighty is our King. Mighty is our Lord. Creator of everything. Mighty is our God. Mighty is our God. Mighty is our King. Mighty is our Lord, creator of his name is higher. His name is higher, higher than any other name. His power is greater. He created everything. Mighty is our God. Mighty is our God. Mighty is our King. Mighty is our Lord. Creator of mighty is our God, mighty is our God, mighty is our King, mighty is our Lord, Creator of His name is higher, His name is higher, higher than any other name, His power is greater. He created everything. His name is higher. His name is higher, higher than any other name. His power is greater. He created, mighty is our God. Mighty is our God. Mighty is our King. Mighty is our Lord. His name is higher. His name is higher, higher than any other name. His power is greater. He created everything. Give God the glory. Give God the glory. Give God the glory. Give God the glory, and He will give you, and He will give you, and He will give you the victory. Say in the blood, say in the blood of Jesus is against you. Satan, the blood of Jesus is against you. Satan, the blood of Jesus is against you. So let us give God. So let us give God. So let us give God. All of, give God the glory. Give God the glory. Give God the glory. Give God the glory. And He will give you. And He will give you. And He will give you the victory. Satan the blood. Satan, the blood of Jesus is against you. Satan, the blood of Jesus is against you. Satan, the blood of Jesus is against you. So let us give God. So let us give God. So let us give God. All of the praise. What a privilege to be here for this last seminar. We do want to remind you again, right after the seminar, we are having the pastors and evangelists meeting right here in the sanctuary. So please be ready privilege to have Pastor Harold Warner here with us this morning. Why don't we welcome him as he comes to preach the Word of God. Thank you, Joe. I'll run offense for you any day. Is that your iPad? No, no. Praise God. Amen. A blessing to be here. I was thinking in the book of Acts, 
the early church, the infancy of what uh, God was going to do when there was the first little bit. Uh, hey, Steve, do me a favor. Just lift this up a little higher. You're close. Uh, when there was a little bit of uh, persecution that came, it says, that's good. They returned to their own company. And I am just uh, honored that uh, I have an opportunity every six months to return here to the Prescott Conference to my own company. There may be other companies, but this is my company. And I am grateful to God for that. So this morning, if you will turn in your Bibles to Hebrews chapter 12, I want to minister from this portion of scripture. Uh, as a preacher, uh, sermons come in a variety and an assortment of ways, too many to uh, catalog, uh, it would be a detour to go into all the different ways. But this particular message was ignited in my soul by simply looking at and reading the title of an article. I hadn't even read the article. Just the title alone gripped me in a very real way, and that title was called Being a Holy Man. And a number of things almost immediately. One was conviction. Lord, help me. Now, if you are one of the gifted people who have arrived and are on the border of glory, then you don't have to listen to anything I say. But for the rest of us uh, who are still in the fight, there was conviction. There was a confirmation. It was like something inside of me, a resounding yes and amen. And then there was a sense of commitment. Lord, that's how I want to spend my life. And it all came from a title. There are strong men today with the gender madness in men and women's sports that's kind of been distorted a bit. There are successful men. There are men that are shrewd and wise. There are caring men and called men. There are serving men. But I believe that none of these comes close to or requires more of us than being a holy man. And here in Hebrews chapter 12, we see this theme as he is talking about the nature of God's love, he's describing God's process with his people whom the Lord loves, he disciplines. But the defining feature and calling for all of these involves holiness. And from the start, let me just say that this may not be a great sermon, but it is a great message. 
And there's a difference. Paul is writing to his son in the faith, Timothy. He's encouraging him to fan into a flame the spiritual gift Uh, or gifts given to him by God, uh, how that God has not given him the spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. Uh, And then he says in 2 Timothy 1, 9, for God saved us and called us to live a holy life. He did this not because we deserved it, but because that was his plan from before the beginning of time to show us his grace through Christ Jesus. He's saying the same grace that saved us is the grace that put us on the pathway of holiness. Brother Pocky talked about a time in his office and it reminded me of Uh, a holy moment in my own life. It didn't make it into memorial stones because it was far too personal. Uh, But as a young disciple here in Prescott, you know, I was discipled for the, you know, the very lengthy time of three years. But I remember a night driving on Whipple Street and all of a sudden the Spirit of God filled my car. Believe what you want, but the Spirit of God filled my car and I'm worshiping God, uh, trying to drive safe, yes, uh, but tears are streaming down my face uh, as I'm driving and I'm saying, God, uh, I want you to use uh, my life. Uh, I want to be all that you want me to be. And 50 years have passed and we're in 2024 and it is still my desire to be a holy man. Look with me. I'm going to read out of the NLT beginning in verse 10. I encourage you to read the whole chapter, but for brevity's sake, verses 10 through 17. For our earthly fathers disciplined us for a few years, doing the best they knew how, but God's discipline is always good for us that we might share in his holiness. No discipline is enjoyable while it's happening. It's painful. But afterward, There will be a peaceful harvest of right living for those who are trained in this way. So take a new grip with your tired hands and strengthen your weak knees. You can write in your margin, that's why we have Bible conferences. Mark out a straight path for your feet so that those who are weak and lame will not fall but become strong. Work at living in peace or make every effort at living in peace with everyone and work at living a holy life for those who are not holy will not see the Lord. Look after each other so that none of you fails to receive the grace of God. Watch out that no poisonous root of bitterness grows up to trouble you, corrupting many. Make sure that no one is immoral or godless like Esau, who traded his birthright as the firstborn son for a single meal. You know that afterward, when he wanted his father's blessing, he was rejected. It was too late for repentance, even though he begged with bitter tears. 
tears. Let me talk to you first of all about the passion of holiness. Because here's where hell's propaganda machine has pulled off a major coup. Because question, think, what comes to mind when you think or people think of the word holy or holiness? Is it a pharisaical checklist uh, that we check off that leaves the heart uh, untouched or untransformed? Is it a self-righteous, holier-than-thou, judgmental person? When you think of holy, does everything sour and dour about life uh, and about religion uh, that leaves out the wonder and the workings of God's grace and fullness? Is that what comes to mind? Because for a lot of people, the very word, they think, well, you know, I'm, I, I'm not sure I'm really in for that. Because in their minds, holy represents everything synonymous with unhappy or miserable. And hell does everything it can to hide what the Bible calls the beauty of holiness. That's why there is no end of distortions that mess with people's minds when we talk about being a holy man or a holy woman. Like I said, from the idea of one and done, you know, like checking off a box, or others, they hear the word and they think of something absolutely unattainable or boring or narrow-minded. And so there is this hydra-headed confusion in people's minds when it comes to holiness. And the devil has been working that scam from the very beginning when he asked Eve, has God said, you may not eat uh, of every tree of the garden? And he's trying to single out the one tree that God said, I don't want you to eat from that, uh, while ignoring the fact that God said, here is an entire paradise uh, that you can partake of. The fear that a passion for holiness makes you some kind of weirdo. You're automatically an antique. You talk about holiness, oh, you're one of those. The truth, though, is we are all in the same boat. Because I didn't read verse 4 that says that all of us, it says your struggle against sin. One thing I know, I'm not sure what the attendance is this morning, but every person in this building is struggling against sin. That's what it means to live this earthly existence. But in the midst of this is God's lofty and loving goal for our lives. I read verses 5 through 7. Have you forgotten the encouraging words? This is something meant to be encouraging. God spoke to you as his children. He said, my child, don't make light of the Lord's discipline and don't give up when he corrects you for the Lord disciplines those he loves. And then in verse 10, for our earthly fathers disciplined us for a few years doing the best they knew how, but God's discipline is always good for us so that we might share in his holiness. 
See, remember that all church discipline carries uh, that goal, that expectation uh, that as a result, uh, people become partakers of the peaceable fruit of righteousness. The expectation of personal holiness uh, is behind all discipline, uh, and that's the power of that one word, afterwards. In other words, your discipline, it sucks to be you, but afterwards. <laughs> thank God for afterwards. And so this morning, this passion needs to have a clear definition. And holy or holiness brings together many, many ideas, but to give a very simple you know, uh, 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 mix of all of these ideas is that holiness means living a life set apart for God. First Peter 1, 15 and 16, your old ways of living to satisfy your own desires, you didn't know any better then, but now you must be holy in everything you do, just as God chose you is holy. For the scripture says you must be holy because I am holy. Now, I'm not making a, 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 a doctrine out of this, but I did sign up. Uh, actually, it was for my brother and sister-in-law, but I signed up also because I used the Bible Gateway app and they have something where they can send you a verse for the day. And I thought this is a good way to send my brother and sister-in-law little scriptural reminders. And so lo and behold, uh, today's verse was that very verse. Uh, you must be holy because uh, I am holy. Now, you know, that could mean anything, but it was as a preacher who has to uh, stand before a congregation like this, any encouragement, I'll take it. Hallelujah. <laughs> One man wrote these words, be holy for I am holy. He is not telling us to be God. He is telling us to be so much bound up uh, with God, so much reserved for him, so much connected with all that brings honor and praise to him, so much in line with all that he is in his character and being that we are rightly said to be holy. These are connected. Now, I believe something. This is why I can preach this this morning, that Christians here can walk and chew gum at the same time. And that means we can grasp the fact that God is holy, but he is also love. And the amens just resounded through here. It, it paralleled Revelation 5. Uh, uh, God is both holy and love at the same time. Do I fully understand that? No, but I believe the Bible. That the central goal of the Christian life a passion that needs to be in our hearts uh, is to reflect both God's holiness and God's love. When I was first saved uh, and uh, the Lord put into my heart uh, a desire to read, uh, you know, hippies are not known for reading lots of books. I'm, except The Hobbit. <laughs> that was the height of literary genius, and Tolkien was a genius, but, uh, you know, uh, but God put that desire in my heart, and one of the, quote, Christian thinkers uh, when I was first saved was a man named Francis Schaeffer, 
and he promoted very passionately these uh, two ideas. And in one of his uh, letters, he wrote increasingly, I believe that after we are saved, we have only one calling, and that is to show forth the existence and the character of God. Since God is love and God is holy, it is our calling to act in such a way as to demonstrate the existence of God. In other words, to be an act in such a way as to show forth his love and his holiness simultaneously. Further, I believe that the failure to show forth either of these is equally a perversion. Of course, in one's own strength, it is only possible to show either love or holiness, but to show forth the holiness and love of God simultaneously requires much more. It requires a moment-by-moment -moment work of the Holy Spirit in a very practical way that we might share the author said, in his holiness and this new passion, this desire, because none of us this morning have arrived, comes from the fact of being indwelt by God's Holy Spirit. So let me talk secondly about the pursuit of holiness, and right here, our minds are indispensable. A.W. Tozer, uh, a prolific author, uh, wrote a book called The Knowledge of the Holy, and the central theme, obviously, was recovering a sense of the holiness of God. And he wrote, the low view of God entertained almost universally among Christians is the cause of a hundred lesser evils everywhere among us. A whole new philosophy of the Christian life has resulted from this one basic error in our religious thinking and probably the best known statement uh, in his book which is talking about possessing a true Christian worldview is he said quote what comes into our minds when we think about God is the most important thing about us. What comes into our minds when we think about God is speaking about the kind of person we really are. Nothing is more important. Nothing is more defining than this. And this is why this is an indispensable quality taking you to verse 14 in our text. Work at, or better, make every effort at living in peace with everyone. So Pastor Nigel started, I'm finishing, it's all weaving together. Make every effort living in peace with everyone and make every effort at living a holy life for those who are not holy will not see the Lord. Kind of simple and plain. You say, aren't you being a little too straightforward? I just am reading what the Bible says. <laughs> Make every effort. It is a pursuit. This is why the first indispensable quality of pastoral ministry is Christ-likeness. You 
that we need to be not just gifted, but godly. And no matter how much I stumble, and I hope we can acknowledge that we all stumble. Who said that? <laughs> Where do you go to church? If you, I don't poach, but do you want to come and to sit and say amen? I said we all stumble. A little better. By the end of this, hopefully we'll be honest enough to come to the altar. I don't, that's all. That's all I'm aiming at. Kevin DeYoung said, true and genuine piety is necessary as the first indispensable requisite. Whatever, quote, call a man may pretend to have, if he has not been called to holiness, he certainly has not been called to the ministry. And I don't care if you're an antique like me, or if you are a baby boomer, or a millennial, or Generation Z, or now Generation Alpha, whoever makes up the acronyms, you know, I, I don't know if they're true, but what, nevertheless, uh, what we're seeing today is that this pursuit is sadly lacking in the hearts of many who profess Jesus Christ. And so he alerts us to two crucial areas. Number one, the importance of relationships. Make every effort to live in peace with one another. That's why what Pastor Brown preached is so true. One book that I put in my library as a young pastor was a great book called Church Fights. And just the title was enough to say, yeah, I want to buy that. And, you know, it's all about church fights. I think Pastor Brown left out one of the biggest ones. You know, we think it's, uh, you know, last night, Rocky, he's ripped, etc. But some of the real fights aren't even uh, uh, men, it's women. And it's like why Paul had to write in the Philippian letter. And he actually called out two sisters, say to Udaya and say to Sintiki, be of one mind in the Lord. Lord, do you realize those letters were meant to be read publicly and he's going through, you know, the beginning, you know, I thank God for my partnership in the gospel with you from the first day until now. You know, you're dear to me. There's joy all through the book of Philippians and then all of a sudden, you know, they're reading it publicly. Say to Udaya, who's sitting over there, and say to Sintiki, who is over here, be of the same mind in the Lord. Get it right. Be holy. So he says, make every effort the importance of relationships in the church and beyond, and secondly, make every effort to, to be holy, and just in case there's any doubt uh, as to the legitimacy, the relevancy of this, he says, without holiness, no one will see the Lord. In other words, it doesn't matter how big your church is. It doesn't matter how great your worship team is. It doesn't matter now with live stream if your sermons uh, are viewed uh, around the world without holiness, uh, no man's going to see the Lord. 
and this has to do with me personally and you, but a pastoral concern is I can have people coming to church. Uh, they can be involved in religious things, uh, but when they step into eternity, they're not prepared to meet God. First Thessalonians, he writes to this infant church, God has called us to live holy lives, not impure lives. Therefore, anyone who refuses to live by these rules is not disobeying human teaching, but is rejecting God who gives his Holy Spirit to you. There is a passion that results in a pursuit. The title, Being a Holy Man, gripped me. And then I did go on to read the article and it quoted another source and he was summing up the various characteristics of holiness, not some narrow-minded, shallow interpretation, but a very broad embrace of many factors, and I'll just quote from it a few, not all of them. It said, a holy man moves mysteriously. His pervasive dependence on God and his otherworldly orientation demonstrate he's, quote, set apart, or as was said of Dallas Willard, quote, he lives in another time zone. A holy man, a holy woman lives in a different time zone. A holy man reveres the sacred everywhere. It said, life is an adventure, not compartmentalized discipleship with the purity of heart to quote, will one thing. A holy man establishes rituals, disciplines, and traditions. He gives attention, it says, to daily routines and details, recognizing how habits shape his life and character. It said, a holy man walks a spiritual pilgrimage. He trusts that his destiny as a man joined to Jesus his king is a story unfolding by the sovereign hand of God. A holy man abides in God. He seeks a consistent and transformative friendship with God who provides power for the Christian life. A holy man seeks a spiritual father. He deliberately chooses close friends and a mentor, all of whom speak into his priorities and direction. We're not talking about a shallow definition. A holy man fulfills a life mission. His life is an ongoing answering to God's call, direction, and authority over him. His life mission is to uncover God's calling and faithfully walk in it, exercising godly authority in the spheres where he has influence. Then he said, a holy man leaves a a legacy. He invests time, talent, and treasure in and for others seeing his life within the larger story of God's kingdom advancing. There's a lot there. That's why I was convicted. That begins to probe 
and broaden us with a portrait of what it means, make every effort to be holy, for without holiness no man shall see the Lord. Let me close and talk about the practice of holiness then. And uh, I was raised in the Star Wars generation, so adapting one of those statements, may the source be with you. Because if you haven't heard enough to realize there better be a source, capital S, to all of this, then we're in trouble and we are certainly not attractive to a desperate and a watching world. The source of holiness is always the cross and God's saving grace. You know, I read the book of Jude. It's not in my notes, but uh, uh, you come to the end of the book of Jude, and now unto him who is able to present you blameless, faultless and blameless in the presence of God with exceeding joy, That's a task to take something more than a human program. And the next time you look at yourself in the mirror, remember that verse, unto him who's able to present you faultless and blameless in the presence of God. And... Whoa. That'll make you fall down and worship him. See, this is the fountain from which all the streams, all the many streams of holiness flows. That's why this chapter ends with a very timely and fitting challenge. I didn't read it in the text for time. But drop down to verse 25 there in Hebrews chapter 12. Little thing about my preaching is that uh, it's a good idea to keep your Bible open because I don't read the text and then just leave it as if it's, you know, we, we go back to what is the text saying. And so we drop down to verse 25 where it says, be careful that you do not refuse to listen to the one who is speaking. God's message through God's messengers is what preaching is all about. I was putting this together and They didn't know, you know, when I get inspired, I get excited. When the oil of inspiration begins to flow, you know, it's just like, it's it's jet fuel in my soul. And I am stirred personally. In other words, this wasn't something, oh, I can't wait to get up and Man, I am going to give it to them today. (laughs) You know, if you feel like that, you know what? Like Pastor Campbell, be that pastor that Pastor Campbell, stay in bed. Don't go to church if that's your mentality. These folks need some encouragement. You don't know what they've been living through. But I'm putting all this together and uh, a sister said, I can't wait 
to see you tomorrow and to hear what God's giving you for us. He always does. The wonder of God's message through his messengers. Be careful that you do not refuse to listen to the one, capital O, who is speaking. And then he brings us in verse 22 and 24 that I'll close with. You know, in our technological age, especially if you've ever used Zoom on a phone call, you know, you can actually choose the background. Uh, I guess there are hundreds to choose from. So, you know, you could Zoom, call me on a Zoom call and I could put, you know, a tropical Hawaiian paradise behind me because that's what the desert is. And... Uh, <laughs> And so in verse 22 through 24, it's kind of like a, a, a holy hologram of images to match the challenge that he's given in Hebrews chapter 12. And in verse 22, he contrasts mountaintop experiences. He tells us that we haven't come to Mount Sinai. And he goes on to describe a place of flaming fire, uh, darkness, gloom, and the whirlwind, all this stuff. I, I think one important point is while maybe they need a glimpse of, you know, just from time to time dangle us over the pit of hell, realizing that's what I saved you from. You're not going to scare people into holiness. It's going to require something much greater. And so verse 22, he reminds us where this source uh, comes from and he mentions four things, I believe. Let me count, one, two, three, four, okay? So he says, you have come to Mount Zion, to the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, and to countless thousands of angels in a joyful gathering. And so he says, you know, where does holiness come from? What is the source? He speaks about this heavenly orientation. You've come, come to Mount Zion, the city of the living God. This is the city that uh, the fathers of our faith, uh, the patriarchs, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, uh, look forward to a city that has, what? Foundations whose builder and maker is God. Uh, and this is what they eagerly awaited and anticipated and yearned to see. How many believe heaven is still in style? That is our goal, that is our destination. And so he sets before them this heavenly orientation. And if you're a little weak in that and you need a, a boost, uh, then just read this afternoon, Revelation chapter 21 and 22 uh, that speaks about this and it will revive you. God, that's where I want to spend eternity the source of holiness. And then back to verse uh, 23. Uh, you have come to the assembly of God's firstborn children whose names uh, are written uh, in heaven. This is not just a gathering of people from different cities uh, and countries. Uh, we're talking about something uh, 
precious, uh, this glorious assembly of God's firstborn children. Uh, I'm not just looking at, you know, a Dave Marks uh, or a Steve Bowman or a Don Petrikowski. I'm looking at one of God's firstborn children whose names uh, are written in heaven. Uh, Lord, I want my name uh, to be written uh, in that book along with this glorious assembly. You know, mark it down. You cannot be holy on your own. The idea of some solitary monk uh, meditating in order to become holy is uh, a farce. You know where you become holy? You become holy in church. Uh, you become holy with a whole bunch of people who are struggling against sin like you are. You become holy when there are conflicts and other things that Pastor Brown preached on uh, and you resolve them. Uh, that's where you become holy. You don't know anything about love uh, until you say, you know what, God, you're holy. I'm going to work this out. Verse 24, the source, you have come to God himself who is the judge over all things. Uh, you have come to the spirits of the righteous ones in heaven who have now been made perfect. You've come to God himself, the judge uh, over all things, uh, that there is uh, a final reckoning that all of us uh, are going to experience. Uh, and let me just say to myself and to every pastor here, the reckoning for you and I is going to be greater than that of others. Because to whom much is given, much uh, shall be required. Uh, and you have come to the spirits of the righteous ones in heaven who have now been made perfect. Uh, you're not perfect now. No matter how much you deceive yourself or you tell yourself that, God is not finished working in us and through us yet, but there is coming a day, and we are to keep that in plain sight. Finally, verse uh, 24 again, you have come to Jesus, the one who mediates the new covenant between God and people, and to the sprinkled blood which speaks of forgiveness instead of crying out for vengeance uh, like the blood of Abel. You have come to Jesus. Oh, I am looking forward uh, to the day, amen, where we see him face to face. Uh, you have come to Jesus. Uh, the one who is mediating the new covenant uh, that says the God who spoke these worlds into existence desired uh, relationship uh, with you and I, desired to bring us uh, into his family as sons and as daughters. Uh, and Jesus is mediating that new covenant through his precious blood which speaks to us of forgiveness. Oh, beloved, uh, this morning the blood still has power to cleanse us uh, from all sin. Uh, and here is the incentive, the source. Uh, he writes about be holy because without holiness no man will see the Lord. And then he said, here is the source uh, that you can draw from to see those things become a reality in your life. I shared this thought with one of my down under fans, Bruce Callahan. You know, the f uh, there is no substitute for the gathered assembly. How many know that? 
the idea that media is somehow going to replace that is never going to happen. But the fact that people do watch you all over the world on live stream ought to put the fear of God in your heart. But he knew about this and he sent me a quote that I close with. Please, for my critics and those who are trying to keep me in line, which it needs to happen, notice I'm going to end on time. Um, <laughs> there is hope. Pastor Olson, there's hope for us. So. <laughs> but he sent me, I think it's a mashup verse or quote from Leonard Ravenhill, a revivalist. But it said this, the greatest miracle that Jesus is still doing today is to take an unholy man or woman out of an unholy world and make him or her holy. Then put them back into an unholy world and keep them holy by helping other unholy men and women become holy. In other words, we're talking about a supernatural work of the Spirit of God. The one of the, the, the brother who runs the sound was asking about uh, my life from the Memorial Stones thing. And uh, uh, it was the irony is Pastor Greg is teaching on this. I'm writing about my conversion. The two parts are what God brought me out of. The second part is what God brought me into. And the whole thing I'm writing about is that it was a period of time where God was laying foundations in my life that I didn't even know were there. And he mentioned, you know, perseverance and tenacity. Were these things a part of your life before you were saved? Oh, dear, no. I mean, I was a runner from the very beginning, run from everything, you know. Uh, Pastor Brown talked about being a quitter, you know. Uh, tenacity, I, you know, someone, uh, uh, Berlin, uh, reminded me of this coming in. I flunked out of the University of Connecticut because I never went to class. You know, uh, my life wasn't a paragon of tenacity or any such thing if there is any good thing it is because Jesus put it there but this is why this verse uh, is still up to date in the context of the father's love make every effort to live in peace with all men and be holy for without holiness no man shall see the Lord. Let's bow our heads this morning. I think a fitting capstone on this morning's ministry. And as I related, all of this came from just simply reading a title of an article that showed up in my inbox. Being a holy man gripped me. That it is never out of fashion. It is always relevant and up to date. And I only scratch the surface at all that is involved in worshiping him in the beauty of holiness. It's something that 
I don't have the words to describe, but beloved, God is love and God is holy. And this morning we've heard the preaching of the word of God In our scripture, see that you don't refuse him that speaks. Yes, it's talking about God and his new covenant. But the men that have preached this morning have agonized and prayed and travailed over what to preach in this wonderful setting. And I don't think I have to add anything else. I don't have to say anything else. Jesus is in the business of taking unholy men and women and making them holy. Be holy, for I am holy means that the family likeness starts to be seen in our lives. I remember the morning looking in the mirror in our bathroom, wide mirror, and I didn't see me. I said, man, I look just like my father. That's what it means, be holy, for I am holy. The father is saying, my likeness, rubbing off on you, transforming you. Maybe you've been ministered to and when you come to the altar, maybe you're going to have to leave your gift there and make some things right. Or maybe you're going to have to pick up the old jawbone that you thought was irrelevant. If there's anything that people have cast away in our age, it is holiness. But largely because they don't understand it. And the church world has done a miserable job at displaying anything relating to holiness. We're going to sing a chorus in worship. I want to open these altars this morning. You can come, find a place to pray, seal all that God has been speaking to your heart and life this morning as we worship God together. Hallelujah. Turn your eyes upon Jesus yes, yes. look full in his wonderful face and the things of earth will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace oh god we are a needy people today Hallelujah. turn your eyes upon jesus lord we need your grace your spirit working Look for in our hearts and lives lord moment by moment to abide and oh god the in you and your word to abide we'll in our hearts and in our minds. Dim. Oh, change, in I the pray, the way we think. of his glory and grace. Oh, yes, amen. Turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look full in his wonder. And the things of earth will grow strangely dim 
in the light of his glory and grace. You know, I appreciate that he chose that song because the ultimate source of holiness, as the song says, is turn your eyes upon Jesus. And our text actually begins by saying, lay aside every weight and the sin that so easily trips us up and run the race with perseverance. How? Looking unto Jesus. Say that out loud. Looking unto Jesus. That is our call day by day. Looking unto Jesus. The author, the champion, the finisher of our faith. Knowing that he that has begun a good work in you shall perform it to the days of Jesus Christ. God, make me a holy man. Make me a holy woman. And let that start infiltrating my gray matter. And that's important because, you know, one of the very foundations of my whole ministry in Romans 12 is let God change you, transform you into a new person. How? By changing the way you think. And we ought to think about holiness in a different, in a new way. Oh, you know what? There's something exceptionally attractive about a holy man, a holy woman couple that has stayed together and kept their vows. It's holy. Oh, it's beautiful. Eric Strutz just preached our final Jubilee Sunday last month, and his wife Brenda is struggling with dementia, memory loss. And my brother, who I've been praying for for 50 years and more, and his wife flew all the way from Massachusetts to come to the anniversary, 50th anniversary banquet, I'm having dinner with him the night before that he and my mom flew back home. And I watched him as Brother Strutz is preaching. And he made, it, it is probably one of the most powerful sermons on marriage where he visits his wife for lunch or dinner every day and he calls them, these are his dates. And the nurse and the whole staff is just blown away by things, but told him, you know, she may not remember your name, but she knows you. And I watch my brother, he's fixated, because this is such, it's a holy thing, and it's beautiful. And he remarked at the end, I thought, wow, this is coming out of my brother, like, whoa, revelation, and, you know. And, you know, here are flags everywhere. And I, I, yeah. But he said, that's not the, he realized the strength of your church isn't in those flags, it's in those marriages that have stayed together for 40, 50 plus years. Holiness is a beautiful thing. And that's why we need to look to Jesus every day. Father, thank you for this time this morning. I pray you would seal 
the entirety of the ministry today to our hearts and minds. Let us think upon them as we go about our business today and come back this evening to rejoice and honor you and receive from your hand once again. And we thank you in Jesus' name. The Lord bless you today. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Just as we close, we want to make just two announcements. There is a meeting right now, all pastors and evangelists. So we ask you to please clear the building quickly. Also, we want to remind you the doors open at 4.30 tonight, 5 o'clock for prayer. And want to encourage us, let's lay hold of God. Before we close, could we pray very quickly for a man by the name of Raymond Finner? stage four cancer. He needs a miracle, a desperate need. He's in, out of Santa Monica. Let's just ask God to touch him right now before we go. Father, we lift up your name. We are believing you. God, for a creative miracle by your hand. God, the blood of Jesus Christ upon this man. God, we are grateful. We are thankful, Father. You are our healer. God, we speak life into this brother. God, your hand. In Jesus' name. Thank you so much. You're dismissed this morning. God bless you. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir.